right. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, very pleased and, and honored to be here, actually. So <clears throat> let's get started right away. Whoops. Back up. Uh, again, thank you for, uh, for coming, and, and thank you for your attendance here. Well, I just want to start by uh, talking about economics generally and then introducing what environmental economics would be about. And economics is about scarcity and trade-offs. We live in a world where we can't satisfy all of our wants and desires, and we can't get everything we want. So this, this is the fundamental economic reality that any economic system has to deal with. The goods and services that we want to consume have to be produced. They have to be produced using labor and natural resources and other factors of production. These factors of production are, have a, are scarce and have mutually exclusive alternative uses. So we face trade-offs. So if we have a forest, we can recognize we can use that to perhaps either produce paper or produce lumber to build houses. But those are mutually exclusive uh, uses. So we have to make choices about how we want to use our scarce resources. And when we choose to use a resource to produce, say, paper, we're choosing not to use it to produce lumber. And that, that's the core area of, of opportunity cost. So economics, I guess, is all comes back to opportunity costs and try, making make sure we identify uh, opportunity costs. But if we want to, one way to organize economic activity is through markets. And markets are a system of decentralized, voluntary, and, and permissionless uh, exchange that's based on property rights and economic freedom. And I think this is important to remember these characteristics, especially decentralized and, and permissionless. All of our market activity, whether it be from uh, somebody who's a, a blogger uh, to uh, transnational corporations, are all based on voluntary interaction. People come together and, and tr use their talents and resources in different ways. Prices emerge out of this process. The people are bidding for, our scare, for alternative uses of scarce resources. Prices end up emerging. Prices allow entrepreneurs to calculate profit and loss, which are a key to helping us identify the most highly valued uses of our resources and directing resources to that, those uses. And then profit also gives entrepreneurs and, and everybody else involved in the process an incentive to participate. That you have to get their voluntary pro cooperation and participation, and you reward them. Next point we want to raise is that generally markets work. This is a point that goes all the way back to Adam Smith, although uh, economics uh, graduate students today would learn in the, the uh, following, in, in the lower form there, of the, what's known as the first welfare theorem. What do we mean by markets? Well, normally the market system, again, the system of voluntary, permissionless, and decentralized exchange, uh, does a great job alter uh, evaluating alternative uses of, of resources and providing entrepreneurs this incentive to do what is in the best interest of, of consumers. Prices are what serve to coordinate the activities of consumers and firms and entrepreneurs and investors. The prosperity that we enjoy today is a product of economic freedom and, and property rights and this market exchange process. Something that goes less noted is that markets perform an important discovery fa function. Now, you normally think of maybe discoveries as occurring in science. So the, the eureka moment when a scientist discovers something we didn't know before. So the, the light bulb, or even like you know, in Columbus, uh, uh, happened upon uh, the Western Hemisphere, happened to find the, the West Indies. But the same thing happens in, a, in the economy. Economics has to discover all of the knowledge that we actually then put to use. So we have to discover what goods and services people are willing to pay for. We have to discover that oil and coal and wood and, and iron ore can be used to produce the goods and services that people want are willing to pay for, and thus that they are natural resources. We have to discover how you can organize a corporation or organize a global supply chain. We have to come up with innovations in finance, like insurance or, or uh, bonds. None of this knowledge is given to us, and it has to be generated in the, uh, the system. The discovery process is never ending. It's still ongoing. And just to illustrate an example of this <clears throat> related more to, to natural resources, consider the, the history of oil. So we began figuring out how to refine oil into kerosene. 
to come up with a, a substitute way to power lights with, as whale oil was becoming scarce. And we quickly ran out of oil because we just had oil that was available at the surface. But then we learned how to drill for oil. Again, that was another discovery. And then we were able to use that uh, refined oil to power cars and trucks. And so we had a great deal of transportation. But then we recognized, we discovered that the smog, the emissions from those cars and trucks could help cause uh, pollution problems that we had to address. And again, it's ongoing. So if you look at the amazing discoveries with uh, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, unlocking a vast new oil and gas reserves, again, it's all part of this uh, ongoing and critical market uh, discovery process. If you ignore the role of discovery in economics and social systems, it's very easy to, in retrospect, assign a lot of intention that wasn't actually there. So for instance, if we look at a, a company in the past was burying chemicals in a, hole, in a giant hole behind their factory because they thought at the time it was a responsible way of, of disposing of the chemicals, well, we later learned that, okay, that those chemicals could actually leach down in, into the, uh, groundwater and contaminate the groundwater. If you didn't realize that people were making decisions based on the knowledge that they had at the time, you would, might infer that, they were, that that company was poisoning the environment. You might infer intent that wasn't there. And the intent isn't there if you remember that we have this giant discovery process. So how do we in, integrate the uh, environment into this process? Well. We can just think of different environmental protection, uh, forms of environmental protection as an additional use of resources. So whether it become uh, providing a habitat for animals, or birds, or fish, wetlands that help, uh, help clean the water naturally, or if you think of clean air or clean water that can be spoiled if we dump waste into it untreated, what we can actually see is that there's an additional use of a resource. And then sometimes these are be non-use non -use uses of resources that we don't cut a tree down to provide habitat. But it's still a use of resources. If we want to make sure that the forests are there to provide habitat for a species, we have to choose not to use the, resource, the, the forest, to, say, to produce lumber. And so again, it's, it's the same basic economic thing of alternative uses of scarce resources. And we have to think about uh, <clears throat> the alternative uses and trying to direct resources to their most highly valued use. Now, a lot of economics ignores a, a lot of the important discovery process that's involved here with the, with the environment. Now, this is a diagram that would come out of a, a textbook showing sort of like the textbook treatment of, of a negative externality. I don't want to go over the details of this diagram. But what I do want to do is use it as an example to illustrate how th there's a tremendous amount of knowledge that's assumed here in this uh, diagram, knowledge that has to be discovered by our economic or, or uh, social system. To detail it, We'd have to know first off that there's harm, that there's a harm that's occurring to the environment. We have to know second that this harm has a human cause, it's not a natural cause, and we have to know the exact economic activity that's actually causing the harm to be able to draw this diagram. Third, we need to be able to know the value that uh, different people would attach to the preservation or non-use use of resources that would uh, be, be generating this environmental benefits. And then finally, we'd have to know what, if anything, can be done to reduce the harm that's being created here. So there's a lot of knowledge. And again, remember, this knowledge is never given to us. It's something that the uh, market system has to come up with on its own, has to develop for us. So what makes a, an environment a, a challenge for economics? Or why is there anything that would be a, a special field of environmental e economics? Well, <clears throat> it turns out that for, for some uh, detailed reasons that, I, that uh, Dr. Simmons will probably be getting into more in, in his talk. Some of these non-use uses of resources can be hard to get their uh, value adequately represented in markets. That due to pro property rights definition or enforcement problems or what economists like to call transactions costs, we might recognize that this trout stream is, is valuable. It provides habitat for, or, or for the trout. And we know that consumer, conserving fish populations is valuable. But it might be hard to, in the market to be able to harness that value and be able to bid against alternative and maybe more direct use uses of resources. So if you're willing to pay to divert water from a stream like this for irrigation for agriculture, that gets represented more fully in the, sometimes how markets operate. And these non-use or environmental protection uses 
it can be difficult to assemble the value that's out there in society. If people do value these uses, it's a challenge. Now, sometimes entrepreneurs can come up with some very clever ways to harness some of that value and, and uh, help, uh, help these non-use or environmental preservation, you know, conservation uses bid in the marketplace. And so you could think of something like ecotourism even as something as a way by which you could harness some of the value that some people will place on, har on preserving the environment as a way to help, uh, <clears throat> help bid for resources. Now, sometimes then when we have uh, these, when the market doesn't work well, we need to rely on a, a government policy to intervene and, and try to direct additional resources to uh, environmental protection. And when we do that, we rely on uh, what's known as cost-benefit analysis. It's a way to try to duplicate what would be happening normally in markets through prices. But if we are, aren't going to be able to use the market for uh, one reason or another, if we, if we believe that for various different reasons that, that we need to rely on government, we need to come up with some way to try to replicate the, the profit and loss analysis that occurs in markets. And that's what we do through cost-benefit analysis. And again, it's not perfect. You're trying to replicate what we would like to have done through the market directly. But this also leads to another uh, point in environmental protection, and that is that our policies that we adopt to try to protect the environment should disrupt the market as little as possible that we do want to maintain as much of the decentralized and permissionless system of, of resource allocation that we have in markets. So that's why economists like things like using uh, pollution taxes or cap and trade uh, or permit systems because it does allow a lot of uh, decentralized and, and permissionless exchange to occur. People don't have to get approval from regulators, which you would have to with command and control regulation. With command and control regulation, you're taking away the, the power of parties out there in the environment to, to make these uh, permissionless decisions. You're shifting, you're, you're creating a system of permission or, or permits that are required for all kinds of different decisions. And that ends up, um, <clears throat> that would end up causing additional harm to the, uh, to the market process. So if we want to protect uh, the environment, we want to do it as narrowly as we can. Well, <clears throat> what does this mean for, for climate change? Because everything I've talked about here is extremely general in terms of environmental economics. There's two points I want to make. First is that the discovery process is ongoing. I think that that's probably particularly true in the case of uh, climate change, although, you know, it, Perhaps Dr. Lair would disagree and say that the discovery process already worked to, to show that maybe there's no harm that, that's occurring. But we definitely are still in the process of having this discovery, of establishing the knowledge that would be necessary before you could go ahead and apply something like, okay, now we know we want to have a, a carbon tax or something like that. So there's a lot of knowledge that's still in the process of being discovered. And we need to keep that in mind. Uh, and furthermore, uh, part of this is the valid, what uh, economist Thomas Toll likes to call the validation of knowledge. That we, we have to have that knowledge be validated in such a way that we all agree on it and are, are willing to use it in, in decision making. And then finally, the last point I want to make is that alternative options exist for uh, addressing climate change. And, and this is uh, a topic Dr. Simmons is going to get into more uh, detail. So, even if it were the case that the climate science were completely uh, uh, settled, we would face choices about what we want to do about the potential climate change. The options, the broad options include trying to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases or mitigation, uh, making economic and societal changes to live with a, a warmer environment, what's known as adaptation, and then there we could also take actions to reduce the uh, concentration of carbon in the atmosphere, say uh, <clears throat> climate engineering. And then there's a range of different mitigation options that we could imply from cap and trade or carbon taxes to command and control. The choices we want to make about this uh, depend on the values that we place on environmental protection and also the, the cost, that we, the value that we'd, have, that we'd all place on what we would have to give up. If we have to give up burning fossil fuels, we have to consider what is the value to people of, of being able to burn fossil fuels. And so therefore we have to balance what we would be protecting against what we would be uh, giving up. And that is ultimately an economic decision. So there's always going to be a, an, an economics at least here. And I'll, I'll leave it to other people on the, uh, in the, this conference who can talk more about the, uh, the climate science because economics is all about the division of knowledge. And I know I've come to the limits of, of my knowledge here, so I will stop. Thank you. Okay.